years that might have turned her into another show business cliche. Instead, Bonnie Raitt became a musical icon. And as you'll see, this is one icon who isn't afraid to tell it like it is. Anybody that's not getting any tonight? Just gotta fix it. I'm driving this roller coaster, and it's all from my creation. Don't you know a little rain at night? And I was all alone. Sitting here waiting for a little voice on the phone. And I plan the menu so that I can, in the course of an evening, have this incredible arc by the end of it. Let's rock them a little and then give them a little blues and get a little down and dirty. I ain't no icon carved out of soap. Send me out of clean up your reputation, baby. And while they're down there, give them a torch song and then break your own heart. Lovers will do almost anything. It is here on the stage where she is most confident, most in control, most alive. I'm a This is the Bonnie Raitt the public knows now. The Grammy-winning, red-headed singer, songwriter, guitarist, whose success was earned the hard way. Dried out from years of serious drinking. Suddenly a superstar in 1990, she then became a millionaire and a newlywed in short order. Yet, she says sobriety, success, and marriage haven't smoothed out her rough edges. I'm stubborn. I like to be right. I will never be told what to do. I know. I rarely shut up. I don't listen well. And that makes me hard to deal with. You know, I'm not deeply unhappy. I'm just not necessarily easy all the time. I'm not sweet and light. You said that the uh, last 10 years have been the best years of your life, but they've also been the worst years of your life. Well, I don't know. I shouldn't have said worst, really, because, I mean, they've been an adjustment. They're not as easy. Things aren't as easy as they were in my 20s when I just wasn't as responsible and wasn't as awake. She is the fiery redhead who sings like an angel and plays like the devil. Thank so you. sweet. Well, it's true. You do sing like an angel and play like the devil. That's and absolutely true. Talk like true. a truck driver. And yeah. talk <laughs> like a truck driver. <laughs> Portrait of the artist, age 49, a life immersed in the business of her music. Move it. I'm about ready to see everyone I know in my whole phone book. Generously sharing her talent with her many friends, like Jackson Brown to benefit a variety of social causes. And I really think that a voice of reason like yours is going to prevail. Well, social could... activism runs as deep as her music. That's the thing, is to get the debate up. Both inherited from her parents. Father John Raitt was a legendary leading man on Broadway. In 1957, he and wife Marge left Broadway for Burbank. Bonnie and her brothers were raised as Quakers there in the aftermath of the McCarthy era. We weren't commie leftists, we were just people that wanted to see the world at peace and to see what we could do that it, to, to make sure everybody got treated equally. Coming of age in Hollywood meant Bonnie Raitt always had something to talk about. Parents' night was always really fun because we had, you know, Burt Lancaster would come and my dad would come. My dad was in sideburns from doing Carousel in Oklahoma all those years. So as a kid, I had a dad who didn't look like a dad. He looked kind of like little Joe on Bonanza or something, you know, or Elvis. <laughs> The pictures of her from that time show a freckle-faced tomboy, tough to the core. Do the pictures lie? No, I think I'm still a tomboy. You know that I related to Annie Oakley, I related to Peter Pan, but not wanting to grow up, and I really related to Gidget, who was right in there with all these guys that were surfers, and they were made fun of her and said, you can't do that, you can't do that, and then she ended up being one of the best surfers, and some of it's just that not wanting to be squelched, you know, don't tell me I can't play this electric guitar as good as a man. It's not why I did it, but if anybody even hinted that I couldn't, you know, drink with the boys or do this or do that, I had that need to prove that I was equal from the time I was six or seven, so that I was probably a feminist before I knew it. For trying to be one of the boys. It wasn't that I wanted to be a boy, I just didn't want to be considered less than. When she was 14, AM radio 
brought her the sounds of the male-dominated black world of blues. Early on, I got Ray Charles, you know? I got the fever. How did a redhead from Burbank get so deep into the blues? Boy, that's, that's a deep question for me. Blues music tends to be about pain and about love and about being mistreated. You could say, when was that ever the case? But I, I have said many times, you don't have to be black, you don't have to be poor, and you don't have to be old to sing of the greatest pain you ever experienced. I think I was 13 and 14. The most agony I've ever been in is being a teenager. Not because I was mistreated, but because it just was hard. I didn't like myself. I felt brokenhearted. I felt not heard. And she was still a teenager when she dropped out of Radcliffe in the late 60s, in the middle of her junior year, to ferociously follow her dream. So I was this little 18, 19 year old college girl getting to go hang out with these blues guys. And I wanted to be older and sing like Etta James and be tough. And I, you know, I started smoking like little cigars and throwing back Jim Beams. And, you know, I wanted to race ahead to get older. And you thought the whiskey, the Jim Beam would... Um, Pickle my it. throat, I think. Well, yeah, because I wanted to be older and sound tough. Kitty on Gunsmoke. And you know, I wanted to own a saloon and have the guys come in and set them up, boys. You know, I really did uh, get to be a woman that fit in with these guys right away on the bus with nothing but guy musicians hanging and drinking with the best of them for 20 years she did just that until she literally looked in the mirror and i said you know what this i'm i'm sick i don't like the way i look i can't remember everything i say at night i'm i'm not being productive i'm embarrassed when people at airports say bonnie you know like that but the final epiphany happened one night in 1986 with her late friend, Stevie Ray Vaughan, who was struggling with his own addiction. I saw him the night he came out of recovery. He came and sat in with me in Atlanta, Georgia, and with his mom in tow. And he was nervous because he had never played completely straight. And he burned a hole in the sun. His spirit was so unleashed. There was something in him, and gets me just thinking about it, that was so powerful. And I said, there goes my last excuse. I do not have to kill myself to play this music. And if he can do it, I can do it. 10 years later, her loan addiction is her music and maybe her guitar. This is my pride and joy. It's a 1965 Stratocaster, which I bought at three in the morning after a gig at, for $120 in 1969. And it sounds, sounds like bacon smells. That's what it sounds like. It can break my heart. It can break... It just expresses, you know, it's my thing. Her thing is also her voice. Perhaps her finest instrument. Not necessarily strong, but definitely soulful. I can make you love me If you don't You can She inhabits her songs, sells them with emotion. It's a talent she learned from her father. For years, her emotional relationship with him was more constant than her connection with any other man. He's now 82 and still joins her on stage now and again. She has long remained intensely independent in matters of the heart, until eight years ago, when she married actor Michael O'Keefe. Uh, oh, God. Like, you know, you know what? There's a reason why that. I do the music. Proud of her marriage now and determined to make it work through the years, she admits it is the toughest commitment she's ever made. Because I'm the boss most of the time. I don't get to be the boss in the marriage. That's been a humbling experience for me. <laughs> Most men would like to have a wife that could stay home and take care of them. That's a big price to pay. And being the center of attention and having great success and, and 
you know, a certain amount of wealth and you're intimidating, it's not an easy task to beat. Most men would not want to pick a woman that has all that baggage. I mean, the same thing that makes me really attractive is also a burden sometimes. So you got to have a certain kind of man that is not thrown off by my fierceness. I haven't seen your fierceness. Where is this I'm on fierceness? my best behavior, Dan. But, you know, I have a lot of respect for you. I'm not going to show you this on our first date. If you talk to people I work with, they'll, they'll, they'll let you know. You know, some of them have said you're fierce. They love you, but... Well, I can be a bitch, you know. I think, we, I think everybody that's in a position of high pressure and responsibility sometimes is not always as considerate to those that work with them because I haven't been... I've never worked for anybody before, and that makes me pretty cocky. That brutal honesty may be Bonnie Raitt's most defining characteristic. Her willingness to examine the darker side of love and life burns through her music. I am an old woman Named after my mother An old man is another Child has grown old Now you know this question was coming. I grant you it's a cliche. But how do you want to be remembered? What do you want your epitaph to be? that before. I don't know why it got me so much, but I'd like to be remembered as someone that was always true to what I really felt. My conscience, my musical taste, my politics, my anger, my frustration, my hurt, my joy, my eroticism, all those things are part of who I am. And uh, I want to be remembered for the full spectrum as a honest, earthy, confused woman that lasted a long time. <laughs>